begins right now. Delilah and I are back for the second hour of the show where each week we bring you the lives of those interrupted because of abduction, suspicious deaths, homicide. Joining us is Monica Quezon of the Q Center for Missing Persons and Barbara Kinsey, who is the sister of Patty Vaughn, who was reported missing on Christmas Day of 1996. She was 32 years old. She was the wife of Jerry Ray Vaughn. She was the mother of three, Brittany, Ray, and Tyler, and she was reporting reported missing in Lavernia near San Antonio, Texas. Um, she was going through a divorce or separation. She was, uh, like many of the cases, unfortunately, that we put on, that, that we are looking for information and asking for the public's help, um, she was ending her relationship with, with somebody who was abusive in the marriage. And uh, on that day, nobody ever saw her. And, and Barbara Kinsey, thank you so much for being here. Your your sister, when's the last time that you had spoken to her? Uh, Christmas Eve. Oh, first, thanks for having me, Susan. And um, the last time I saw Patty was Christmas Eve, um, 1996, uh, for a family gathering. We'd all gotten together with our children to celebrate Christmas, and as we did every year. So that was the last time I saw her. You and I were talking before the the show yesterday, and this mm-hmm. was very interesting. When you first met this person, what was your impression of the person that she had met for you to meet that she was going to date or marry eventually? Um, when I very first met J.R., probably 13 years before she disappeared, and they had come to California to visit, um, I immediately, uh, I was concerned. He was very controlling. Um, it wasn't someone that she would usually date. So, uh, in the end, I didn't attend the wedding because I, I thought she was picking the wrong guy. So Apparently you, you didn't right. attend the wedding because you just knew, and this is really important because a lot of family members that are listening, dating yeah. somebody, we have to listen to the people around us, our friends, our family, and we don't do that. And you well, did. That's a pretty big red flag if you're if you're not willing to go to her wedding because you didn't approve of him. No, no, and, and you said he was he was controlling and. And and you know she, she but she was in love with him and she did as many people that are in these relationships do it's okay I can take care of it I can handle it and and right. so when you you learn that she's missing he makes a phone call <laughs> and calls your sister and says what time is it and, and then right that um, was the moment that was actually on the twenty sixth of December when we first realized that she was actually missing and that was that's exactly what he said he called my sister Kathy. And he said, what time is it? And she said, 7.14. And he said, we can't find Patty. She's missing. And he's not the one that files the missing persons report? Or, no, or makes no. Contact. My sister Kathy actually filed the missing persons report. Um, he was adamant that we would not file it to let him handle it. And we just weren't going to wait. I mean, we knew right away something was wrong because Patty would never ever be away from her children. Never. She never has. So um, right away we knew something was wrong. It was just a gut feeling. I mean, she the only place that she would have ever gone had she gotten a fight and actually left, like he said, which she would have she would have come straight to us. She would have gone to my sister Kathy, our mother, um, but she would have had her children with her. So we knew right away that something well, was wrong. And they were separated. And, 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 and Barbara, you go straight to the... The family does the Bexar County Sheriff's Office, and yeah, Bexar County, right? And and then you, uh, her va- her van is found at the side of the road, right? The um, actually, her employer found her van on the side of the road about I think it's like five miles from her office, which was it was two miles off a of main highway and five miles from her office, and it was parked on the side of the road. The tire had been inf- intentionally deflated. The van had been clean. Um, the carpet had been shampooed. The seat was pushed all the way back. But yet they still found was, blood under the rear seat of the van. That's yeah. something they must have missed with their magnifying glasses. They were cleaning up their own crime scene. Right. They found blood. Uh, the carpet was still wet when the crime scene uh, and when the investigators came to uh, check out the van. 
um, actually the uh, CSI person that was doing the fingerprints inside of the van kneeled inside the back of the van. He sl- slid, I think so she slid the door open and kneeled in, and her knees got wet. So the carpet was still wet, but they actually found blood um, uh, uh, behind the driver's seat um, in in pieces and parts where the seat belt connects down underneath or the seat connects underneath the van. From I'm sorry, underneath the seat and the back seat. So there was blood and water with blood in it. <laughs> when you when in the you, van. when you go to the house and the nine year old daughter who's in the house runs to you and now she's not been uh, properly reported missing. You're you know you're basically all gathering to do stuff and and you say to your your niece we're going to bring mommy home. You know we're going to find mommy. And what does she say to you? Actually, I was standing outside of the house and a detective was talking to her father. And I had come to the house to receive items of, clo- of Patty's clothing to uh, give to the search dogs. And um, uh, Brittany ran out of the house. She was, like you said, nine years old. And she ran up and grabbed me, and she was crying. She was very upset. And I said, honey, we're going to find your mommy. And she said, it's okay, Aunt Barbie. I know my mom is in heaven, and I can look up in the sky at night and tell her I love her. How would she know that unless she was in the house? When Patty died? I have no idea. I've never spoken to Brittany since that day. That was the last time I spoke to her. And, um, yeah, I, I have no idea how she would know. Those children were never questioned. They weren't allowed to. But that's what a, uh, somebody that's a potential... Has he been named a person of interest or a suspect since any of this? He was just recently named a suspect. Um, only after uh, the show disappeared... Uh, filmed in December. The Bear County Sheriff's Department have named him a. Uh, they've named him a person of interest. I'm sorry. Let me correct that. So that's just recently. They named him a person of interest just recently. But, um, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, well, Monica, you coming into the case. When were you first notified by the family, and, and the and the case was registered with the Q Center? Um, it was a few years ago. Um, Barb called me, uh, panicked one night. Um, she had gotten my number from someone um, and had been promised for like a year and a half or so uh, for someone to come and search this particular area. That was a great concern of law enforcement and the family as well. And I guess they kept putting it off and putting it off. And uh, that was her initial call to me. She was in tears. She was, uh, I would say, hysterical. Barb, I believe you'd agree with me. Um, and, and begging me to come and help and come and search and what have you. And so from there, I think uh, it was just a matter of a week or so, um, maybe two weeks at the most, we were making preparation um, to get out there, and we did, in fact, fly out there. We did, in fact, search the area and dig up this uh, this area and, and got back on planes and went home, and we were able to eliminate that space um, for the family and for investigators. So... Um, and ever since then, of course, we've been in touch, and I've worked closely with her law enforcement and um, and that type of thing. But that was the initial call. It wasn't even, you know, let me write to my mom, of course, then she had to. But um, it was like, you know, I got your number from someone, and they told me you would listen um, and that you would help us. And so after I heard the story, I was just appalled that um, no one had gone and ruled this area out yet. And, uh, you know, and that's the whole thing about search. It's, it's eliminating space. And sometimes we don't always know where that person is, but every time you eliminate space, you're one step closer to where that person may be because you know where they're not. And that's what people don't understand. You know, it's not always about going out and let's be hopeful that we do find something, but you can't always guarantee you find something. But even walking away to know that person isn't there is just as successful in your search effort as if you would you would have that recovery because you know that person isn't there. That tip is no longer valid. Let's move past that and look at other stuff. And people don't understand that. You just don't go out and, and say, I'm here and, and put up billboards. No. This takes planning. It Very takes hard. It maps. It's, it, is, it is, like you said, you've got all this space in, in a big city or a small city or in a rural area, and you take that and you look at the whole area and you start point, step by step inch by inch, mm-hmm. and you decide, and then you eliminate that area so that, like you just said, you don't have to search again. That's why what the Q Center does is so important because for many of these families, even though this is 1996, 
it's not out of the possibility that she will and could be found based on the fact that you've already eliminated the space, Monica, and that you're, you're not, you're continuing to be there for the family. You're continuing to take tips. You're continuing to get the information out there. Um, and many families, after so many years, when they don't have contact with those people that they're not married to anymore or they're not you know, directly connected anymore, they don't feel that they have a right, um, family members, to contact someone like you, but they do, don't they? Right. And, well, and, we just, you know, we have to remain hopeful in every case, that's and, right. and tips are going to come in. And, and with this particular case, with Patty, is that, you know, the person that could have been involved was in construction and had a lot of access to a lot of construction zones at that time and areas that were being utilized. And, and that actually became part of some of the concern for the family as far as searching. Um, and I think investigators at, at several points, too, is that, this was an area he, he buried stuff. This was an area he brought scrap material to or what have you. So, um, you know, those areas had to be ruled out. We're going to take a break. Right. We're back on the Patty Vaughn case. She's been missing since December 25th, 1996. We'll be right back with Ma- Monica Quezon from the Q Center, Barb Kinsey, and Delilah. Stay with us. And now, Susan Murphy Milano proves there's more to her reputation than a keen mind and big hair. The Susan Murphy Milano Show. Welcome to another hour. Hi, this is Michelle with LaBellamy Vineyard. You're listening to Hear Women Talk Radio on the Zeus Radio Network. In the blockbuster Millennium Series books and movies by Stig Larsson, the main character, Lizbeth Salander, is both victim and deliverer of justice to a human trafficker. Tune in with Dottie every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern and play with fire, kick the hornet's nest, and maybe even get a tattoo of a dragon on traffic. Safe for victims, hostile to traffickers. Listen, chat, call, save lives. That's traffic every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern on Hear Woman Talk Radio. Hello, race fans. This is Jeff Gilmer, creator of RacersReunion.com. When you're in Myrtle Beach, check out my favorite, the Caravelle Resort. The Caravelle Resort has a golf department and concierge with golf privileges at virtually every course on the Grand Strand, including the coveted Dunes Club. And ladies, pamper yourself with Caravelle's Studio Spa. Featuring services such as Swedish massage, heated stone therapy, reflexology, manicures, pedicures, facials, and more. Awaken your senses with the most requested massage and spa therapies. The Caravelle Resort, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, 800-507-9145. Get the best rate on the Grand Strand when you use promo code RACERS at thecaravelle.com. 800-507-9145. What's that on your computer? Nothing. I know he's having an affair. I just can't prove it. She gets weird phone calls all the time. I wonder who she's talking to. Do you know what your spouse is doing on his computer or her cell phone? If you want to know, do what the private eyes do. Talk to Steve Abrams of AbramsForensics.com. Steve is an expert in computer and cell phone forensics and a highly regarded attorney. He's the private eye go-to guy, and he's your guy, too. So if you want to know what your spouse or anyone is doing on their computers or cell phones, talk to Steve at AbramsForensics.com. That's AbramsForensics.com. Or just click on the Abrams Forensics banner ad on Hear Women Talk. And for a free 15-minute consultation, use promo code. Zeus. Hi, this is Jessica Dorvaj, host of the Where Is My Guru show, and you are listening to Hear Women Talk Radio. And now, once again, here she is, Susan Murphy Milano. We are back with the case of missing mother, Patty Vaughn, who has been missing since December 1996 on Christmas Day. Um, And, you know, this is very disturbing, and I've been very nice. First segment, quiet. Uh, Didn't Hmm. jump up and down, but I am just screaming inside because there's so many things on this case. Um, in on December 29th, 1996, the sheriff's office, the criminal investigation unit, they go in there into the residence of Patty, um, and they d- use this the chemical luminol to see about blood and different things. And a relative on his side, on the suspect side, um, 
says, oh, I cut my tooth or did something. I had to bleed out in the house. Well, first of all, that's not her house. What the hell is she doing in that house? Secondly, why didn't they right away? Because they had markings in there and the bedroom floor, the bathroom, uh, the closet area. Why didn't they make an arrest? I do not understand that. Did they, did they give you any indication as to mm-hmm. why they just didn't arrest him right there? Well, first of all, they um, first of all, Jr. gave them the, her husband, Patty's husband, gave them permission to come into the house oh, to boy. do the luminol test. He had no idea what luminol was. I, I'm pretty sure because it was basically a new thing to the public back, you know, almost 15 years ago. Now it's quite common. Everyone knows what it is. But back then, you know, it wasn't uh, as prominent as it is today. So, anyway, he um, Im- he let them come in to search a certain area of the house, and then they did their test, and they uh, found the, lum- the luminol. The luminol reacted strongly in the bedroom, on the floor, on the wall, um, drag marks, swipe marks, swipe marks, on a mop, on a bucket, um, in the closet, the ba- the master closet, in the master bedroom. So um, it was quite a bit. They took no pictures of no, any of no the No picture evidence. at the crime scene. So you no, got a, a van with no blood. Pictures, and you got a house with and blood. And they never, they never cordoned it off as a crime scene. Once they found that blood, what should have been done is everyone out of the house or leave them in the house long enough to go get you um, a warrant and come back and cordon it off as a crime scene and then do your extensive test. Well, they had to prove that that blood in the house was Patty's. That's so they couldn't um, arrest him right immediately because they said that as soon as they got the DNA uh, results back, first of all, they well, had wait, to... Wait, 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 I understand. Wait, wait, let's, let's, let's go to the ba- van because the van has blood in it. It's her blood. It's fresh. <laughs> you could tell it was cleaned. Why didn't they, from that point forward, then, you know, then after they go in the house, regardless, they have enough? They have to prove that it's Patty's blood. They have to prove that it's Patty's blood, and that took several months. That that in itself was such a fiasco, Susan. If you knew what really happened with that, you would be appalled. Anybody listening will be appalled. They told I'm appalled that, that this asshole's soon, not arrested. I mean, that, that's the first but, and foremost. Okay, but you listen. They told us that as soon as these this DNA test came back and it was Patty's blood in the van, in the home, in the bucket, uh, in the mop, on the wall... Um, in the baseboard, um, they would ha- they would arrest they would make an arrest. That's what they told us. So we wait. How long is it going to take? Four to six weeks. We wait four to six weeks. We get no answers. No answers. Three months. Four months goes by. We can't get anyone to talk to us and tell us why. They keep saying there's a backup at the crime lab. There's this. There's that. So we go to our favorite reporter in San Antonio, who by now has become our favorite reporter because she's helped us all along the way. And she goes and she starts asking questions. And she finds out that the DNA has never been sent, the blood's never been sent off. It's still sitting on the shelf at the medical examiner's office because the county will not put up $3,000 for the blood test. Is they it- never told us that. When, when the news came out with that fact and it, when she came out with this story and it interviewed the medical examiner, in San Antonio, and he said, oh, your blood's still sitting up here. They haven't paid to have this test done. We have to send it off, but it cost $3,000. We would have given them $3,000 that day, the day that they took the test, you know, they took the, the blood samples. We would have given them $3,000 right then had we known. The suspect but no was, one ever told us. But the suspect was and a was, contractor, though. Did he, did he have a... His personality in town, did everybody know him? His family had a lot of money. Do, do you think that that had a factor in this? I don't think so. I don't think it's so much as his family had a lot of money as his family was a stable, respected family in the community. Okay. And they uh, they did they did fine for themselves. You know, they had a small ranch and did fine. Um, but um, they were respected in the community. Jr. had lived there most of his life, so I he knew everyone. He knew the sheriff in the county. He knew. Um, uh, yeah, he probably the, built additions for him and things. And done st- I yeah, mean, he's, he's probably a good, a good guy. Boy. These guys are good guys, right. all of them. It's a good old boy. It's a good old boy um, club that he belonged to. So I don't think that had anything to do with this because San Antonio, Bear County, is a much bigger, bigger county than the actual county that they lived in, and uh-huh. they had taken over the case. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. Apparently they're 
they had more um, experience and they had equipment that Wilson County, which is actually where she lived, did not have. So Bear County took over the case. And um, they were, uh, our communication was strained to say the least um, with us after they had lied to us about the DNA and they didn't send it off. So the DNA, which should have taken four to six weeks, took us six months. Did they did they question the suspect and the relative who happened to be there doing a little dance about her blood being in the house and things? Did they ever question her um, and maybe even have her submit to a blood test? Uh, you know, no, I don't, no, I don't. I don't know that they had her submit to a blood test. I know that originally, um, Jr. was interviewed for four hours. He gave a statement and he asked for his attorney. And he refused the lie detector test. Because here she is, she's confirming, um, she's saying to the world, yeah. when they come she there, this never, is my blood. Right. And it's not. She was never, uh, I know she was never given a lie detector test um, or offered one. I don't know if she was offered one or not. I know she did not give one. And um, I know that um, it took uh, maybe two years ago, the police actually spoke to Patty's children and went back to the sister and went back to Jr. But of course, Jr. refused any questions, and uh, but how can I you know, don't this know, is what's wrong. I don't know what his sister said, and I don't know. Uh, well, what it, it, she, obviously, she didn't say that she's going to be one of uh, you know could be an accomplice of right. this thing, and it's an obstruction of justice. Period. But here's the kids; you don't ever see them again, basically, and and he has, as we've seen in. Um, Divinovsky's case and Peterson's case and Pernierce's case, all these cases across the country, in in Josh Powell's case, Susan Powell's case, the kids are never allowed to have access to any family again. They can't talk. It does seem like allegedly, Brittany was in the house. She did hear or see something. It is likely that she knows. Um, and Absolutely. you know, you're threatened by somebody who is they're afraid of, and they're what, not going to talk. What kind of reasons did? he give to the other side of the family why they weren't allowed to see the children? Bar- no reason. No reason. Never, he doesn't have to give one. Does Drew Peterson have to give a reason? Well, no. I'm never. Just, almost immediately, the ties between our two families, which had been inseparable for all these years, um, uh, ties between our two families were, were cut completely. Okay, so, And these are families that spent all holidays together, Mother's Day, what? Easter. Was there any reason Christmas. given? Nothing? Just, no, okay, I nothing. don't want to see you just, anymore? Yes, just completely cut all ties um, with our children, between our children who are very close, and between all of us, nothing. It was almost immediately black and white. It was them and That in itself uh, is sus- well, suspicious I thought behavior. We would have come, right. I thought immediately we would all come together to look for Patty. We would all come together. You know, and in the very beginning, it was made to look like Patty had been abducted off the side of the road. And, of course, that's, you know, the very first day, that's what we all How did they were make it? How well, did... this, this happened. This happened. It wasn't until we realized there was blood in the van and blood in the house that we went, oh. Well, no. how did they make you know? it look like she was abducted? I'm, or was it just um, her, speculation? Her van, right. Her van was on the side of the road, and it was heading in the direction of her, her job. This is... The next day, that morning, her boss drove to work, and her van was not there. When he left to come back down that road for lunch, her van was not there. At 1 o'clock or one thirty, when he left to go back to the office, down, back down that road, her van was there. So sometime midday, her van was parked there. It was the front tire, the front right tire, had um, been intentionally deflated. And we know that because there was grass in the tread. If the speed limit is 45. Patty drives like I do. Speed limit is 45. We're doing 48, 50. She gets a flat tire. There's going to be some kind of damage to that tire or that rim. There was nothing. The tire was in perfect condition. Um, it grabbed the threads, grabbed the glass right where it sat, and the tire a year later still held air after they refilled it. Can I ask you what about? Friends, you know, she was she was divorcing him. He was she was you know violent. They were going to split up. She then runs into somebody, and she has a somebody that she perhaps is start starting to date. Where are all her friends? Where are the people that she confided in besides you know the family, the immediate family, meaning you and everybody else that knew what was going on? Um, Patty was a very private person, very private, and I can tell you that anytime she had any evidence of any 
physical violence in their relationship, she would she never admitted it to us. We saw the controlling. We saw the throwing things at her, the yelling, the screaming, the controlling. You can't do this. You wear that. You go here. You, and they were very very involved in their church. So most of Patty's friends were couple of friends that they were all friends with, and Patty's friends were her church members. Um, outside of that, pretty much it was just us. It was my sister Kathy and I. But you were going to take um, her to go get mother. an order of protection that next week, which you never had right, the opportunity right. to do. Were you right. able to tell I police just, that, that she was in a bad marriage? It was. Yep. And that, did she go see a lawyer? Absolutely. Did she go see a lawyer, no, consult with no, one that you it, know of? No. When, when, the JR, when she and JR split up, he absolutely would not even give her a dime. Let me tell you how poor, how broke this woman was. For Christmas, she wouldn't say, ever take a handout from anyone. She just was not like that. Can you hold but on? Right, right. We're going to stop right here. We're going to take a break. Two minutes. We'll be right sure. back with Monica Quezon from the Q Center and the Patty Vaughn case, San Antonio, Texas. Stay with us, please. Hi, my name is Jesse Jordan with Further Faster Initiatives, and you're listening to Hear Women Talk Radio. Tonight, take an adventure on the Myrtle Beach Ghost Walk. Explore the haunted swamps where alligators and the ghosts from long ago still reside. Stroll across floating walkways beneath the Spanish moss as your pirate guide leads you by lantern and shares 13 spooky tales along the way. The Ghost Walk departs nightly at dusk, only at Barefoot Landing in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Call 843-361-2700 or visit MyrtleBeachGhostWalk.com for advanced tickets. The Myrtle Beach Ghost Walk. Hi, this is Deb Coletti, the host of The Deb Coletti Show. Join me at my new time, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, on Hear Women Talk Radio Network. This year brings a whole new lineup of guests, fascinating women and men, sharing their journey to a life on purpose. Unscripted, uncensored, but always entertaining. Tune in to The Deb Coletti Show every Wednesday at 1 p.m. At Scalore, visit our store at 4822 Highway 17 at Barefoot Landing. We have the largest source of hats in the greater Grand Strand area. Tilly, Stetson, Indiana Jones, Wallaroo, Top Hats, Mad Hatter, Derbies, Felts, Fedoras, Cowboy, Golfer, Driver, Life is Good. We carry a large selection of women's fashion hats as well as Red Hat Society hats. We also have an assortment of umbrellas, canes, and walking sticks. Hats Galore, located at Barefoot Landing in North Myrtle Beach. We are the best source for hats in the Grand Strand area. Hats Galore at Barefoot. Hello, Hear Women Talk fans. Are you ready for a vacation? How about a carnival cruise? When you're ready to get down or relax and be pampered. Yes, Mom, let me get your fresh power. Or escape to a romantic hideaway. Book your next carnival cruise with Christmas Travel and Tours. Fun, friendly, affordable. Call our friends at Christmas Travel and Tours for your next carnival cruise at 888-950-5849. That's 888-950-5849. Or on the web at christmastravelandtours.com. That's Christmas Travel and Tours because it doesn't have to be a holiday to take a holiday. Carnival. Fun for all, all for fun. Ships Registry, the Bahamas and Hammond. Hi, this is Judy Collins from Judy's House of Oldies, and you're listening to Hear Women Talk Radio on the Zeus Radio Network. Welcome back to Time's Up with the Jane Wayne of Justice, Susan Murphy Milano. We are back with Monica Quezon, founder of the Q Center for Missing Persons, and we are back with the case of Patty Vaughn. Uh, I don't even like to be able to say her last married name, Patty Brightwell. I mean, but it's Patty mm-hmm. Brightwell Vaughn. It just it irks me that these guys get to do this, and and that somehow the memory of what they did lives on in you know not being in able to remove the name, uh, because in 2005 she was declared dead and by the courts, so that monies and things could be done. And you did something pretty ingenious, didn't you, Barbara? Oh, actually, it was my entire family, my, my family. Um, I come from a pack of very strong women. And um, we went to court and blocked him uh, collecting her life insurance and made sure it was put in trust for her children, for their college funds. And, uh, of course, they, his side of the family said that we were trying to get her life insurance, which 
which was absolutely crazy. I mean, we all, everything we've ever done has been for her children. And people don't so understand that. They that. Know. His ego. Yeah, how much. His, right. His, his ego is out there. His ego is, you know, and Monica, the difficulty is this, this man is a contractor and, and was able to do things all around town. So in, in trying to search for her, uh, to recover her, how difficult is that, even though you reduce the space, how important is it for you to depend on, on tips? Because somewhere along the line, somebody p- perhaps knows something. Well, definitely the tips are important. And we have gotten a few that law enforcement are and are still looking into as far as um, trying to get to an area because there was flooding at the time or what have you. But as far as, you know, profiling or looking at him, you know, you have so many areas that he had open. And when I say open, there were like open construction areas at the time um, that he had access to, that he could have gone in there and buried trash or, or her or anything else. Um, but then you also um, have the route of her car and, and looking at all of that as well, you know, was was she put out, you know, somewhere that's non-related to him. So it's it's really, there's just so much to look at with Patty's case. And, uh, you know, and every time something comes up or there's a new area that's located that we can prove by paper trail or whatever um, that he was attached to in any shape or form, then all of a sudden it, be, it becomes the next search zone, if that makes any sense at all. It does. What um, about the that house that they lived in? Wasn't there some additions and things put on after she... Or just before she she went missing, right? At, right after after Patty, um, at, when Patty was in the home, there were two. There was an old burn pit in the back. Uh, there was probably I think it was eight acres, and um, the house was more towards the front of the property. And there was a old burn pit, and they had just recently, I believe, back in August, dug a new burn pit. Well, right after, not long after Patty disappeared, those burn pits were both covered. And then when he sold the property, um, the people that he he broke the property up and sold it in pieces, and they put trailers out there over those burn pits. So, So, so Monica, then, hold hold up. Monica, how then is it it difficult then after all this time to then get the dogs out there, do the searches because of all this re- renewing of ground and, and, and different things, movement. Is it difficult then to go back out and try to, to, to find her? Um, I mean, it's difficult because of any time any terrain changes or burning occurs or what have you, but it's definitely not impossible. And I think there's been more than one search that was conducted out there. I myself have never been with teams on that particular property because by the time I got involved, they had moved past that property. But what I would hope in any cold case is that they go back and start at the beginning again and, and redo some of the search efforts. But I do... Um, have have pretty good faith in in the teams that they used um, in the onset of the case. I actually know one of the ladies, and um, so I do believe that that area was searched. You know, whether something was moved later down the road or what have you, that's always a possibility. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, actually, Monica, the property was never searched. They initially walked. Um, they w- no, that had the property inside the house was searched at one initial time inside the home. Yes. Then um, yes. the next. Day, um, the Bear County Sheriff's Office showed up with a volunteer who had um, a search dog and walked the perimeter of the property. And I walked with them. It was not. It was probably eight of us walking with one dog, which Monica, you know, it was know. not a, right exactly. And I didn't know that at the time. I've learned so much since this started, but that property was never properly searched, and all those. Uh, the most that the, what we know is from aerial photos that we have taken, flying over and doing the Google Earth, looking looking at the property as the years pass. So it is likely so the that the property was never properly searched. Never. So then that begs the question: Then um, you know, in these, in all these cases, not just this, but let's just use this one because it's right here, and it should be resolved, and it's not, and that's what's disturbing about the whole thing is that he was the last person to see her. The conduct, his behavior, his threatening mannerisms, why they were ending the relationship, how he took the children away. Well, I think, too, one thing that hasn't been brought up yet is the fact that uh, she went missing on Christmas Day, December 25th, mm-hmm. and he filed for divorce the next yeah, day. Yeah, he, f- he files for divorce the next day. Um, again. Well, everything screams in this case. Everything screams in this case, and I know... Um, you know, I don't understand why, in some cases, that is so obvious and why, um, you know, people can't 
be brought to justice or, or you know, other things being done. I just, I don't, I re- this is one of the cases that puzzles me because there is so much that screams that, you know, something occurred in that home with the immediate persons in that home and, and the children, you know, I do believe, especially the oldest child, um, knows something and I don't understand why, like, they haven't come down on this, like, a task force, like a major, in a major way, because I do believe this case could be solved. I just don't know, you know, where all the pressure has been applied and why it hasn't moved forward past where it's at. And I can tell you, too, that when, when the children that, that were there that, or that know, what they don't do is they're afraid. First of all, that's their only surviving parent left. Secondly, they are in some way, if they're not directly told, that you want to go where Mama's going, otherwise you won't be here anymore. And, the, and there's that fear. In a lot of cases the parent doesn't do that he just caught, you know treats them with love gives them extra affection and and tries to make their lives even though they know the secret um we just had a case recently where you know the after all the years the kids came forward but they couldn't while they were in the home they were afraid that the, the relatives had tried to make contact they were police never spoke to them and in all of these cases look at beth profeta's case she, her mother is still missing and right away immediately the the father, the husband, the stepfather gets to go file for divorce right away. There's nobody that is is mm-hmm. seeing all of these things and these patterns, and it makes it very difficult. And we, and we know it. It seems from just I don't have all the information yet, but it seems that just from what little I did garner is that in in this case, you know, the pattern and, and the things that he did, but also the the ability for law enforcement to go in, um, and and that these kids that are grown ups now need to to not be afraid and 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 they and they should come forward and even if they called anonymously monica even if they called the q center anonymously at at and left a tip at 910-232-1687 nobody's gonna know that it was them are they well actually i mean if she calls in and tells you i heard my parents arguing and i think my dad killed my mom she still doesn't know where he put Patty. No one knows except him. I think. I mean, maybe I think you're going to get more than I think. I think you, you know yeah. because here you, you've not had any contact. You, you know, you you you've not had any what whatsoever as far as you know being able to to see them, to do any gatherings with them, to to have a, any association with them for fear that they might talk. He had a captive audience with these little kids. And this he was, reminds me so much of the Dianovsky case. So many of the same exact. Things are happening uh, where where they isolated the children. They were not allowed to speak of their mother. They were not allowed to even know when her birthday was. And she's still and missing. Then, yeah. Oh, she is. She's still missing in Illinois. But after these, yeah. after these, bo- they were boys grew older, and and through therapy, memories started coming back. They actually it makes me took wonder, them to court. It, ma- it makes me wonder if there's not a how-to book out there that. Oh you yeah, know, they all pull it from about. from some secret place like, like that. Gonna, <laughs> I mean, that's the only way. I mean, I can think of. Plus, the, it, it just it it's it's beyond my understanding. Um, with so many facts, like I said, this guy's walking. He's in your community somewhere, and and we do know, or allegedly, that that there was somebody that had to have helped him with that much blood. This guy didn't do mm-hmm. it himself, and the person right. who is related to him. Who had who had probably given some sort of an excuse or an alibi? Why would somebody stick their neck out and show up when the police are coming to to look for somebody if she was so close to them? If she didn't possibly understand or have a hand in what happened that night? I have no idea. Um, he had some kind of control over the women in his family. He was very abusive to the women. Well, in his and family. then once you commit uh, these kind of crimes, what happens in mo- almost all of them afterwards is that you say you want to wind up like them. If you say one word. Or, or it's even the look. They don't even have to say it. They just shoot that look, yeah. and, go, and it's that look of, I'm going to wind up like her if I don't shut my mouth be- because right. of that power. Is is he still living? Is the suspect still living in San Antonio, Texas? No, he's not. He's in another state. Is, did he get he remarried? He did remarry, and he got divorced, I believe, about two years ago. We should check on... on did divorce. Is, is she... Okay. So he got a legal uh, divorce this time, not a... Yes. Okay. Yes, um, I, they weren't married very long, just a few years. All right, and and so. and did you since then have you been able to? You call the police department what every week, every couple <laughs> of weeks? You know, I am constantly in touch with them uh, via email or um, actually send them a text. 
the officer on the case. Um, uh, send him an email most of the time. And if it's really important, I'll call because I know he's a busy man. Um, but not that it's not important. I mean, I don't just call and pester them about the little things. It's it's important things. Okay. It's uh, that he got married, that he got divorced. This is where he's at. Um, you know, uh, this is where Brittany is. Can you please go talk to her? She's an adult now. And there's a lot I of things, too, at the assets, with the assets. It was in joint tenancy, and so he had pretty much wherewithal uh, to do with what he wanted. Well, his mother died of brain cancer in 1997. His mother died, and she before, she, before Patty disappeared, she had made a codicil to her will that left that property in that home, which originally belonged to her and her husband. She uh, left a codicil that changed the... Um, beneficiary and the ownership from his from JR's brother to he has left the property to JR and Patty and Patty okay there's a codicil to the will that leaves the property and, so and, there and, are many and, and legally yeah, he couldn't he couldn't sell that house we're going to be right back in two okay. minutes with Monica Quezon from the Q Center <laughs> we are discussing the Patty Vaughn case and stay with us we only have 12 minutes but they're going to be lightning fast 12 minutes and, and we need everybody's help so we'll be right back thank you Hi, this is Jessica Dorvaj, host of the Where Is My Guru show, and you are listening to Hear Women Talk Radio. What's that on your computer? Nothing. I know he's having an affair. I just can't prove it. She gets weird phone calls all the time. I wonder who she's talking to. Do you know what your spouse is doing on his computer or her cell phone? If you want to know, do what the private eyes do. Talk to Steve Abrams of AbramsForensics.com. Steve is an expert in computer and cell phone forensics and a highly regarded attorney. He's the private eye go-to guy, and he's your guy, too. So if you want to know what your spouse or anyone is doing on their computers or cell phones, talk to Steve at AbramsForensics.com. That's AbramsForensics.com. Or just click on the Abrams Forensics banner ad on Hear Women Talk. And for a free 15-minute consultation, use promo code. Hi, this is Deb Coletti, the host of The Deb Coletti Show. Join me at my new time, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, on Hear Women Talk Radio Network. This year brings a whole new lineup of guests, fascinating women and men, sharing their journey to a life on purpose. Unscripted, uncensored, but always entertaining. Tune in to The Deb Coletti Show every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Hello, Hear Women Talk fans. Are you ready for a vacation? How about a carnival cruise? When you're ready to get down or relax and be pampered. Yes, Mom, let me get your fresh power. Or escape to a romantic hideaway. Book your next carnival cruise with Christmas Travel and Tours. Fun, friendly, affordable. Call our friends at Christmas Travel and Tours for your next carnival cruise at 888-950-5849. That's 888-950-5849. Or on the web at christmastravelandtours.com. That's Christmas Travel and Tours because it doesn't have to be a holiday to take a holiday. Carnival. Fun for all. All for fun. Ships Registry, the Bahamas and Bahamas. Hi, my name is Jesse Jordan with Further Faster Initiatives, and you're listening to Hear Women Talk Radio. Blazing the trail, the Jane Wayne of justice is circling the courthouses of America, speaking up for those who have been silenced. Susan Murphy Milano declares, time's up. And now, back to Susan Murphy Milano, because there's never too much Susan Murphy Milano. We are back with family member Barb Kinsey. She is the sister of Patty Vaughn, December 25th, 1996, San Antonio, Texas. She went missing. I want everybody to remember this name, Patty Vaughn. I want everybody to remember today's date because now we are going to begin to do what we can to, to scream as loud as we can for justice. To um, We're going to contact Ted DeBias out of Washington, who is the nobody former prosecutor who also provides information to families on how to proceed. We're going to do that right away. Um, we're going to get other information on the case and start piecing this together because there is a man living out there that's a suspect that is responsible for the murder. I'm not saying alleged. I'm not, she was killed based on the fact that he 
over his rage, didn't want her to leave, wanted her to stay in the abusive marriage. This happens all the time. Yes, this is a case that was not documented. Yes, this was a case that was behind closed doors. But let's lift the silence for Patty Vaughn and her family. And if 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 Brittany is listening, who who is in another state now, what would you like to say to her, Barbara? This is that's Patty's daughter. Um, first, I'd like to tell her that I love her and I miss her, and um, that her mother didn't leave her or her brothers. That she was taken away from them. That she would never have left you, never. She loves you so much. And if and if she's listening, I you know she can reach out to me. Um, I am the daughter of of and a product of the same environment. And it's very difficult when you're afraid and in fear. And I couldn't speak out until after my mother was murdered. So, Brittany, if you hear this, know that that no one is, is... People have not told you the truth. People have kept the truth from you and put you in fear. And you know in your heart your mother was murdered. You You can't silence and be living in silence. You have to speak out in a way that will get her found and get the person responsible. I know that's your father. I know that, that, that you know, you don't want to believe that he could be capable of this, but the reality is that it's likely very, very possible. And it's also likely very possible that the suspect's relative who was in the house that day had something to, to do with this as well because she assisted. So if she's listening, because we always say, Delilah, every show, The person responsible for each murder of each case that we put on, they are listening in the live broadcast or the after broadcast. I suggest you Google my name, folks. Uh, Go to SusanMurphyMilano.com. I suggest you start paying attention to uh, the blogs I write, the cases that I work on behind the scenes, um, and what I do so that at least a case gets moved forward so that there's a hopeful prosecution. And the ultimate goal is to find her. But in the process, don't think that you're getting away with murder. Be- and strut li- out there like some big cockadoodle bird because your ego is so big, justice will come back. And it's going to be back for Patty. And in the end, Patty's going to win on this in this lifetime because this case is just so horrific as far as getting away with the, the, everything that's gone on for all these years. Um, Monica Kaysan from the Q Center is not going to give up. Monica Kaysan is keeping it out there and and. You know, she brings these cases to us, and, and there's so many of them, uh, that and, and, and to get it out there, this is a crime. This is against the law. Just because these people were married, there was blood out of evidence in the house, blood out of evidence in the van. That The, the day of, of getting away with murder is going to stop. Uh, moving on with your life is going to stop. And, and for your sister, you know, sh- say to, to all of her children, what she would say to her kids if she could talk to them? What do you think she'd say? Um, well, I, if she could talk to them, she misses them. She loves them. She would have never left them. And that she probably would ask them to forgive their father, knowing Patty and what a good, strong heart. A good, she had such a crazy relationship with God. and um, They all she, do, though. And I used to tell my mom, yeah. God can't stop a bullet. And and yeah. and it and it's and, no, and I had to no. forgive my father too, so I understand that. Yeah, I think she would ask them to forgive their father because she would never want her li- or she would never want her children to live with the hate. But it's not that the hate it, and it, the anger. But to remove and erase her, and and to not question, especially since they're old enough now. To to it's not about that. It's about getting out of the trauma zone that they might still be in. It's going to be very difficult when, when Brittany and, and the boys uh, have children. It's going to be very difficult um, when, you know, they, I'm sure that at some point that they will want answers, and I know that that's their dad. It isn't about hate. Right. It's about justice for mom. Well, I, I think that at, that, at this point, the, these children are just becoming adults. They're just learning who they are. And once they once they get out and away from the home, which which Brittany has done, um, you know, and they're away from their father for a while, and like you said, when they become parents, then they're going to start asking questions and they're going to want answers. Right now, I think they just want to move on with their lives. Is the only reason I can think of that these children haven't tried to find out answers on their own, not even contact us, 
but find out answers on their own. And who knows and, if, if they were with their father that day in some capacity. Who knows anything? And, and who knows, again, even if they called in a tip where they suspect, where they maybe were getting up in the middle of the night to get a glass of water and they saw right. Dad digging on the, the property in the back, right. Right. they need to call I'll, the tip line at 910-232-1687. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, also, I want those children to know that their mother asked me the night before she disappeared to help her follow a restraining order because she was afraid of him. She was afraid that something was going to happen. So I want them to know that she knew. She knew that, that it was bad and that it was going to get worse before it got better. So I want them to know that she didn't leave them. She would have never left them. She loved them so much. We all do. We love them and we miss them and we hope they have good lives. I mean, I hope he went on to be a good father and raise them right. I have no idea. I've never seen or spoken to them since. And, and that's and that's a tragedy right there. It's, it's, they want to silence the memory of the person that gave them birth that brought them into this world. They they right. silence it and take it away, and hope that you understand. And and um, it, she wasn't important enough. She wasn't important enough to file for divorce the next day. He filed for divorce the next day. Yeah, because uh, he knew. <laughs> I don't know if that was just to get custody of the children temporarily or what purpose that served or to... Well, he was done with her. You know? He did, yeah, and, right. and, and that was it, and that's what they do. They get the belongings out of the house. They say, Mom doesn't exist. There's no more pictures of her. All of a sudden, she's right. erased from their lives, and that's exactly what happened. And, 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 yep. and again, people that are listening who, who don't feel that they, after all these years, this is 1996, Monica's doing a, a 40-year-old case right now in Spokane, Washington. Uh, they don't give up. That the the important point is that justice can still happen. Your family members can still be found, and we all deserve to be in a place that that we can be located because of somebody else's hand that takes that person's life. We all deserve to to you know be brought home. Right. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. We have our it's our inalienable right to to be where we are, who we are, with who we are. And if we're gone from this earth and we're no longer here, our family has the right to have our body to go and grieve and to put it a place to rest that's and right. to mourn. And that's, that's, that didn't happen, and it's not natural. And we are one of those families, like all those families, who and, thought and it would never happen to us. Nobody ever does. happen to anyone. It you can. have to see the signs. You have to see the signs. No one ever thought it would happen. None of us thought it would happen to us. You it, never do. No, and as a child of a product of that environment where, you know, both of my parents, my father was a cop and he murdered my mother and then took his own life, you don't, you know, you you ex- you, you recover from it in some way, but you, n- you never expect it or, or um, accept it even after all these years. It just doesn't happen. You bury well, these, it. These children are not, they, they were old enough to know their mother. They're That's not right. going to forget her. They're not going to stand for not right. knowing. But, but the somebody truth. has made them Every forget about her day. and covered up for her. And sure and, they have. and so, um, Mr. Suspect, are you listening? Miss um, Accomplice, are you listening? Uh, again, you know, even if somebody were to call anonymously to the Q Center, again at nine one nine two three two one six eight seven with a tip, um, then you wouldn't have. Uh, people like myself jumping up and down. It is the least you can do. It is the least you can do. And and to to go with that secret and not know and and not find her um, is 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 even more. Well, and not, not only that, but any other woman that would get involved with this man, look at the risk that they're yeah, taking. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing because there's, there's yeah, as, as, always a risk. As soon as you are arrested, sir, we will make sure. That if you bond out, I'm sure you would. That we will have your picture all over the place. I'd like to do that now if I could, but it, I don't know. We have to try to find out and get it more, you know, um, solid as far. Maybe he'd like to come on and do an interview of the show. That's it. Let's invite Absolutely. him to the show. I would love. I would love to hear what he had to say. Let's invite the suspect on the show. I will be Absolutely. very nice. I will not be condescending. I will listen as I would be accepting of my own father murdering my mother. I would listen. And I would take in the facts and let him tell his side. I invite him uh, as an invitation to the show. I can be reached at Times Up for Justice at Gmail, or you can get a hold of Delilah at Delilah at ImaginePublicity.com. 
um, and we'll and we'll have you on, and and you can tell us that we're wrong. I want you to tell me I'm wrong. I want you to tell me that I don't know. I want you to tell me that that she just ran off somewhere, um, and that you don't know what happened to her, and and, and but it's not going to happen. I'm, Ten bucks says he's probably starting to think about lawyering up, actually, as he should. Um, right. Probably already has. He probably already has, or he's got one. Well, he's in a different state now. Is he still doing contracting work? Actually, he, yes, he is, but he's not uh, self-employed anymore. Uh, he works for a company. And, and I'm of, sure that um, he said he's a widow because, it, you know, this but, is another thing. In 2005, she's declared dead. So he can say legally that he is a widower. Well, He actually put that on paperwork, registering his children long before he had her declared dead. Long before he has her declared dead. He has yes, widower. He so put, here's a son of a bitch. You know, this is deceased. what just gets me mad. Here's this guy. He does this. He yes. registers his to, kids for school she's not even declared dead no one really knows if you but if you did the crime you know what happened to her he registers the children in school as a widower yes mother deceased and, and what year do you know what year this was was it the first year after she was missing uh, it was the second year after she was missing. Okay, for the law enforcement that are listening to this in San Antonio, Texas, um, confidentially, nothing goes very far. Uh, we don't out this information. You need to get a hold of me. There's some documents and things that I just got uh, an idea for that can be done very quickly, that can be secured, um, that would also lead to uh, uh, evidence, his own evidence, his own admission, uh, that this case can be charged. And we are going to go ahead and get a hold of a few people who who do know body prosecutions. Texas is a great state. Uh, Kelly Siegler is from there. A lot of the people that we deal with. Monica Quezon is down in Texas right now um, on the Shonda Townsend. 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 Townsend case right now. There is a group of people. They put the billboards up. She went missing on July 4th, 2010. Everybody needs to support that. Everybody needs to support the Q Center this week, not just for Crescenda Townsend, but for families across the country. They do an amazing job. Um, go to their website at ncicmissingpersons.org. And, and please help them and get the information out. If you're going on vacation this summer, take somebody that is missing and there's no information for and get that out there. We can't do this show without your help. We can't solve these cases. We can't get these tips. So please, we, we can be, re, we can be, I cannot talk today. Time's up for justice at gmail.com. Remember also, if you're going through a violent relationship and you are thinking of leaving that, to please go pick up a copy of the Time's Up book and, and do the evidentiary abuse affidavit and video. Go to SusanMurphyMilano.com or Amazon.com. The Q Center, again, is 910-343-1131. 24-hour number is 910-232-1687. For Delilah, myself, and the cast and crew here at the Zeus Radio Network, we will see you next week. God bless and be safe. And let's find some justice this week for Patty Vaughn. Thank you very much. Your girl